So I'd uh, like to uh, get us started with our next presentation. Uh, this is Mr. Frederick Alexander. He's a partner at Morris Nichols in Delaware, and he's going to be taking us through some uh, hyp a hypothetical tour of some governance issues with uh, Delaware's public benefit corporations. So let's give a round of applause for Mr. Alexander. No clap yet. Uh, so I don't know if people had a chance to read the hypothetical, and it, it, we sort of did this article with, with three hypotheticals that raised uh, different issues that might come up um, when you're doing an exit transaction in a company uh, that's a public benefit company. And just to, to clarify, and again, uh, you know, you, you heard this before, I think everybody talking this afternoon is really talking about legal entities that legally have the status of being public benefit corporations. And just, I want to say from a, from a lawyer's perspective, because maybe it's a little bit different from the entrepreneur's perspective, there is a very clear difference. Uh, and, and I think sometimes entrepreneurs don't want to ask what, what, was, what was talked about this morning as the hard question. And the hard question being, well, let me say, the easy question is, well, gee, what if you think that if you treat your workers well and if you care about the environment and if you care about the earth and do all those things and wrap them in your business, if you think, well, that's just going to make you even a better business and make more money, then we don't, none of us need to be here or talk about this. There are no issues because the world's perfect and you just, you know, do great things and make a lot of money. I think the fact is, or at least the concern is, that in many cases we do have to make hard choices. Sometimes those hard choices mean we make a little less money. We as entrepreneurs, we as investors, whatever, uh, and we're willing to do that because we think there are other things that are of equal or greater importance. And that's the idea of these legal entities because for the most part, the legal structure for corporations today is the job of directors, and some people will say there's a debate. I will tell you there's not really a debate if you read the cases. If you read, if you read the cases, the job of directors is to maximize value for their stockholders. That's the current state of the law. These entities that 22 states have now, or 21 states in the DC have now adopted, change that. And that's radical, and I, I mean that in a, a good way. It's a, it's a big change, but it raises a lot of difficult issues. And a lot of people in the legal community who talk about the problems with um, public benefit corps focus not so much on the concept, but on the operation. They just say, look, it's too hard to change the, the the goal of corporations from value maximization to multiple maximizing strategies because you can't serve more than one master. Today, what they say is today, well, we tell the directors to make a lot of money and then we have government put in regulations and, and they'll take care of that because otherwise there's a risk that there'll be too many variables for directors to choose among and that will allow them actually to sort of really just do things that are good for the directors and management. And what I'm going to walk through in these slides is some of those issues and how they come up. But what I would say to you is when you hear that, what you ought to sort of point people to is the history of corporate law as it stands today. Because the fact is you have all those sorts of issues even when you just have directors having you know, duties solely to stockholders. Because stockholders have different views and they have different uh, time horizons for their investments. And there's lots and lots of complicated law. And the same sorts of questions that we ask for M&A for benefit corporations, you know, if, you, if you've taken a corporations class, you realize that we're still asking all kinds of difficult questions and we don't know the answer just for straight M&A in a non-public benefit corporation. So I, want, I, I wanted to say that before I launch into these slides so that you sort of keep in mind, these aren't slides to say, oh, public benefit corporations aren't going to work because there's these complicated questions that we don't know the answer to. It's really to say it's an interesting area of the law, and hopefully the courts are going to help us figure out the answers. OK, so now I'll sort of launch into my, um, there were three hypos in the article, and I can give you the details of the hypos uh, very briefly. Um, so the first hypo, I don't know if you may look at it, but the first hypo involved sort of a sandwich company uh, that sold sandwiches, uh, Chicago-style sandwiches, but for every sandwich they sold, they gave one away. Kind of sounds familiar. Um, they gave one away, and they also used sustainable practices uh, to, to make sure that they were getting their, they were sourcing uh, their food from, from good places that did all the right things. 
and you know, in the, in the hypo, um, they decided, you know, the stockholders or a majority of the stockholders decide to sell the company, uh, and some of the stockholders who weren't happy with the price sought appraisal. And if you've taken corporations, you know that in many mergers, not all mergers, but many mergers, the stockholders who aren't happy with the deal can petition the court uh, to award them the fair value of their shares rather than the consideration that was delivered in the merger. Uh, and, and one of the things the hypo in the article goes through, but just to get to the bottom line, is in any benefit corporation merger where you are, are taken out of your benefit corporation position, uh, you're going to get appraisal just like you would in a, in a regular corporation. And these are just the rules um, for, for normal corporations in appraisal. You, you get the fair value of sort of your entity as a going concern, and there's no special rules for public, we call them PBCs in Delaware, for public benefit corporation appraisal. Um, so what we tried to bring out in the, in the appraisal is, okay, well that, or in the article is, well that's easy, uh, you know, in a, in a regular, we'll call them C corps, a regular corp, a non-PBC corp, because you just say, okay, basically the court says, you had a, you had a, uh, a financial asset, a share of stock, uh, that was basically the right to a future set of cash flows. You discount those to the present, and that's your, that's your appraised value. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. And that's, that's pretty simple. But there's an immediate question when you do the, an appraisal, when you appraise the value of a PBC, because are you appraising the pecuniary value to stockholders? Because remember, the idea, my, my little lecture there at the beginning was to say, you're really separating some of the value and applying it to the benefit. So what that, that tells you is, well, maybe you know, a corporation that would have a, you know, 100 cents of value, you're giving 5 cents of that to the public benefit and 95 cents to the stockholders. So when you try to appraise the fair value of a share of a PBC, are you, are you doing one? Are you appraising the pecuniary value of the share? Or are you appraising the full value uh, of the enterprise and giving the stockholders their pro rata share of that value? Now, the argument sort of, and the, 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 the thought process behind you know, door number one, just giving stockholders the pecuniary value of their share, is that the idea of an appraisal is to replace the, uh, the cash flow to, to the stockholders. Uh, and you know, they weren't going to get the additional value, so you just replace the pecuniary cash value. And that avoids sort of giving a windfall to the stockholders who opt out of the merger consideration and say they want appraisal. Um, and you're just not making up to those public benefit stockholders the value uh, of, the, of the public benefit piece. And to my mind, that seems particularly appropriate if the sellers of the company have arranged through contracts or otherwise to make sure that the public benefit value of the company is preserved in its new form. So if you sell your company uh, and you get a guarantee from the buyer that they're going to continue to give a sandwich you know, uh, away for every sandwich they sell and that they're going to continue your sustainable practices, it would make sense that you only get that 95 cents of the full value of the company. But, but now I want to go to the, the, other, the other door, the other possibility, and that's that in an appraisal of a PBC, you'd get the full pro, your full pro rata share of the value of the enterprise. And before like thinking about exactly whether that's the right answer, I think I'd say there's two methods by which you could appraise that full value. One, and think about the sandwich company here, is to just sort of, okay, well, let's imagine that instead of giving a sandwich away, we sold as many of those sandwiches that we were going to give away as we could, and took that, the marginal profit from those. And let's suppose that instead of using uh, the sustainable sources that we used for our, our, our product, we just you know, bought as cheap as we could. How much more money would we make? That's how valuable the company is on a non-PBC basis, and we're going to give stockholders that value. And you can see the problem there, because the buyer, the buyer of a company owns the, um, the appraisal action, so they're going to be dissuaded. They're not going to like that result. The second method, which in some ways is even worse for the buyer, uh, is to value the public benefit. In other words, you say, and here's this to me actually, in, in theory, 
makes a lot of sense uh, because the whole idea, I think, behind a public benefit corporation is from a societal perspective, there's more value in allowing people not to maximize stockholder value because you know, that, that can cause sort of inefficiencies in the big picture. But if you actually take the value of the benefit they're providing, feeding hungry people, sustaining the environment, and, and making sure we're using the right kind of sources for our, our foods, um, there's actually probably more value there than just the amount they save. That's why benefit corporations are so good. So that would be a very true way to get the full value. But if you think about it, and we go through this in the article, it would be almost impossible to obtain that value. So it's interesting, but probably impossible. Um, and you know, the last point on this slide is the problem with either of these is you've fully, you've, you've taken all the value and given it to stockholders, or at least the pro rata value to those stockholders who choose not to participate in the merger consideration. And that leaves nothing for the public benefit. And of course, the whole point of public benefit corporations is to you know, continue this benefit, particularly in exit transactions. That's where the issues are most likely to come up. So I think um, on the second bullet point, I would think the real way for a court to look at this when this question first comes up is to look and see if the public benefit's going to be preserved. And it would make sense to me that if the, the sellers of the business, the people who control the sale process, do what I think is the right thing in the context of a public benefit corporation, which is to preserve that public benefit somehow, and we'll talk about that in the third hypo, they do something to preserve that benefit, that in fact, uh, I'm a pointer here, I'm doing this one, let's see. If, if, that, that, that you really should, in fact, um, do the lower value. Whereas if a court found that the, the entrepreneurs just kind of went crazy and did an auction and sold it to somebody who was going to do all the wrong things, maybe the right way to come out in that appraisal proceeding is to give stockholders the full value. And I think my real point here is sort of common law or legislative solution. I don't think we can write a statute. I don't think anybody can write a statute that's going to really get to the bottom of this. I think it's going to have to develop uh, in the case law. So that's, that's sort of the thoughts on appraisal. I'll pause there in case there are any questions before I go to the next hypo. And actually, I think if you don't mind, we're just going to do uh, questions um, actually as a panel with all three, oh, great. Uh, all three of you at the end. Great. Of great. That's e easier to have no questions. Uh, hold Except that it doesn't give me a chance to, to get a drink. Um, <laughs> So let me go to the, the next typo uh, in the paper. <laughs> was we, we took a, um, a company uh, that had a, uh, a religious element to it. Uh, I actually think it was owned by uh, a Mennonites who had particular uh, nonviolence um, uh, concerns. And they sold games and videos, uh, but, but they were nonviolent games and videos. And uh, eventually, that company was sold. Uh, or went through a, a sale process, and there was an offer from sort of a conglomerate that was going to find synergies by taking this company and sort of mixing it with a broader game company that did sell violent games, and they were going to sell, and they were going to pay the stockholders $50 a share. There was another buyer who was going to preserve uh, the nonviolent nature of the, um, of the product, uh, but only pay $40 a share. Um, and so you had to compare those two and sort of look at the balancing and, and do all the, the, you know, answer the hard question. But then the further thing that came up in this hypo was that the board um, wanted to take the lower price deal because they were balancing, you know, both uh, public benefit and value maximization. But they wanted to enter into an agreement with the buyer that if, in fact, the stockholders voted the deal down because they wanted the, the higher value, that the first buyer, the buyer who was going to keep the games nonviolent, had an option to buy the gaming division uh, at a, at a uh, bargain price. And as a result, the company would only be worth $39 a share to the second buyer. So they were sort of forcing the stockholders' hand. And in regular deal protection, we call that a crown jewel lockup. And so what this hypo tries to do is sort of take these two principles uh, that we just have 
you know, in regular corporation life, value maximization, that's the Revlon case. And then you can have deal protections to protect your deal, but they have to be reasonable and non-coercive. It takes those two principles and then compares them to the balancing provisions in the statutes. 365A is the provision that says you've got to balance your public benefits with your value maximization. And 365B says, this is important, that directors get the benefit of the business judgment rule when they do that balancing. So how are these, how are these uh, different principles going to balance out when you have a, an exit transaction uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a PVC? So first of all, we think we can balance, right? That's what the statute says. And in fact, I'd say balancing in a Revlon and a sale transaction, that's the heart of the PVC concept. It goes, you know, it goes back to, you know, when people first got sort of agitated that they, they got to, you know, they thought they had created this great company that had all these great principles and then it was time to sell. And lawyers told them, well, your outside investors can actually force you to tell, sell to somebody who violates all your principles. I think that's a, you know, and Jay kind of talked about how that happened, you know, to him. Um, so, you know, it, it seems that you ought to be able to pick the 40 over the, over the 50. And, and I'll have this next slide. It's not really math. It only looks like math. I promise it's actually not math. So uh, to me, it, it, the first thing to sort of think about is, well, what is, if, what is maximization? What will it mean in a PVC? And I've kind of got this thing that I call the, the maximization efficient frontier, where you can say, OK, we've got, you know, imagine again that there is the hard question. So the more public benefit you get, the less money you get. And there's a curve. And it's not going to be a pretty curve like this. It's going to be like that. But there's some curve. And one sort of simple thing for value maximization to be would say, well, if I'm going to have, you know, um, let's say here, you know, $35 of value, then I can't take $35 of value on a deal that's here where I'm getting less public benefit. In other words, if I'm going to insist on a certain amount of money, I've got to get as much public benefit as I can. Again, if you could quantify those things. And the reverse. If I'm going to insist on getting you know, the preservation of the nonviolence, then I'm going to have to, and that's sort of here on the, on the, on the chart, then I can't go, you know, go down here and get that. I've got to get the most dollars I can while preserving the nonviolent nature. And that's, I think, kind of an easy way to think of the maximization as working. And, and I think most people who think about PVCs think that's just fine. Now, now, maybe you can't go to the extreme. Maybe that's the balance versus consider, and you've got to be somewhere you know, in here, not sort of the heart of the curve. But as long as you're somewhere on that curve, that's probably OK. And I think that most people who think about PVCs would say, it's no problem doing that and choosing the $40 deal over the $50 deal. However, I think that it's less clear in a lot of our minds that you could do the crown jewel piece. So what we have here in, in our hypo was a crown jewel that sort of forced the stockholder's hand because while under the statute, stockholders get to vote on mergers, you know, most decisions are just made by the board. This is a special decision. It's got to get stockholder approval as well. Things like crown jewels or very high breakup fees that say if your stockholders vote the deal down, we're going to have to pay the buyer or the, you know, the potential buyer a lot of money. Those things, you know, the cases sort of talk of those, talk about those as being coercive of the stockholder vote. So I think the conflict that you run into, we know directors can balance when they're making a decision. But we don't, what we don't know, what we'll have to wait for the case law to sort of develop, is whether in doing that, they can make choices. They can, in doing that balancing act, they can make choices that sort of force the stockholder's hands. Because on the one hand, you might say, well, that can't be because, and, and what, what, and this came out a little bit, I thought, on the investor panel. W one thing to think about is uh, under, under the, the public, under the PVC regime, directors have much more uh, you know, room to maneuver than they do under regular corporate law. So maybe the stockholder vote on major transactions is even more important. Like it's an important check on the broad mandate of 365. And if you think that, if you kind of come out on that side, then you would be very leery of things that seem to uh, force the stockholders' hands and deal protections. You might even think, 
steel protection law should be more restrictive of boards than it is under straight corporations. Um, on the other hand, you might say, well, no, 365 means what it says. In making a decision, even a decision to enter into a lockup, stock or directors ought to be able to balance, and that would sort of overcome the law that governs stockholder votes and therefore makes it hard to enter into to lockups and high break fees and, and crown jewel lockups. Again, that question has yet to be answered, and I don't think that we ought to try to come up with an answer because I think this is, again, if you sort of compare it to just regular corporate law, it's developed over the years, and I think you know it's a very it's it's a very uh, it's very nuanced and very fact based. You often when the judges talk, that's that's often what they say. They talk about how not talking about PBCs, but but when they speak about corporate law, they often talk about how it's hard to give general principles. And I think this is the same kind of thing. We're just going to have to wait and see. And and you know, in my in my own sort of mind, I don't even know what I think the right answer is in our hypo. Uh, and then the, the last um, hypo we had talked about a company that made pet food uh, and it was organic and sourced in a very careful way and they gave um, like a fifth of their product to no-kill shelters and, and so they, 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 they had that. And there were some questions, there's some, if you look through the hypo, there's some things that are very close to the statute where we sort of raised issues about well, if your beneficiary are, beneficiaries are animals, uh, not humans, does that count under the statute? But, but I just want to talk about the M&A stuff today. Um, and, and what happened in this hypo was the company was sold to uh, a bigger company, and the, direct to, the, the two founders uh, bargained for the right to be directors on the board of the, subsi of the acquired subsidiary, but they only had two of five seats. And the agreement, the sale agreement, um, had a lot of language in it about, you know, the intent was to continue, but there wasn't real tough, weren't like a lot of, there wasn't a lot of teeth to the language. And so the, the, the question sort of raised by the hypo, oh, I'm sorry, and then there was a hostile takeover of, of the bigger company by an even bigger company. And they just were like all about synergies and why are we, you know, why are we uh, giving away product and, aren't there much cheaper ways to source our food and all that kind of thing. And, and so the question was, well, was there anything that the old stockholders could do at that point? Um, and you know, so here I want to sort of, with that in mind, think about some of the questions that, that we already asked. Like if you were in an appraisal proceeding, if you were one of the stockholders in that deal and you were in an appraisal proceeding and the court was saying, or the other side was arguing, well, you should only get value for the former pecuniary value. Might you as a stockholder say, well, that would be fine if they had really locked up the benefit, but this very loose language doesn't really guarantee anything, and that benefit could evaporate tomorrow, so therefore, there really is no public benefit carryover, and shouldn't I get the full, the full value? Um, and, you know, similar lines. Um, if you were in a situation, like let's say you were in the crown jewel situation and somebody challenged that crown jewel and the company said, well, under 365B, we get the benefit of the business judgment rule and we were doing this to max, you know, because we wanted to make sure that we went forward with the deal that preserved the benefit. One argument you might make as a stockholder is, yeah, but there's nothing in this agreement that really guarantees the benefit is gonna go forward. And, and so, and, and, and that's why I say it's very difficult to write these principles into the statute. I think they're gonna to have to develop uh, in the case law. Uh, and the final sort of thing asked, the question asked uh, by the hypo is, well, what relief, say the sale happens, the hostile takeover happens, so you're a few years down the road. Is there any relief that the stockholder who got taken out two years before might seek at that point? You know, could they seek an injunction to make the company, the, the new company, uh, you know, follow the benefit? Seems unlikely. Uh, I don't know how they would have standing, and there's really nothing as described in the contract that gives them a firm legal right. But maybe they would go back and ask for a price adjustment, saying, well, you know, we voted for this deal on the theory, and you told us in the proxy statement that you had preserved the benefit, but you really didn't, and there's this 
the last sort of possible remedy, there's a lot of activity in corporate law under this idea of quasi-appraisal, which is even if you don't follow the procedures in corporate law to get an appraisal action, if it turns out that the company didn't tell you enough about the deal, uh, maybe you can come back and get appraisal later. So here, I think the suggestion would be, well, somebody would come back and say, well, I didn't seek appraisal because I, was, I thought I was getting something to replace the pecuniary value because you had told me you were preserving the public benefit value, but it actually turns out that you gave away the public benefit and it wasn't preserved, so we should have got paid the full value of the company. So th th those are the three hypos, and I'm gonna I'll just really quickly show you a couple of slides that uh, some people in here have seen before. And, and this is just, I think, a general way to try, and I think David Chen referred to these slides earlier because I used them at a conference over a year ago. Uh, these, these slides just give you an idea of, I think, if you start trying to quantify what's going on in exit transactions and what we're trying to address by having these PBC type statutes. You know, this is just the idea that under the non-PBC regime, if you can sort of try to make, make, you know, how you treat people, how you treat the environment and money, if you could somehow sort of uh, make them equivalent into these quality units, um, you know, under today's regime, all you look at is one type of quality, which is how much money is being paid. So if you've got $10 billion, you say that's 10,000 quality units, and you know, if that's a great deal. If we had another, another offer where it was $9.5 billion, but we're, we were creating you know, lots of other value, uh, so it was kind of about the same, maybe a little more, you're forced to take offer one because all you can look at is the dollar value. And then offer three is just kind of even worse. It's like, well, we're creating all these jobs. We're reducing our carbon footprint extensively, but because it's slightly, you know, 2% less uh, in maximization, we can't take that deal. And, and this is just to suggest that the, the regime we have currently is insane because, you know, you just, how can you live in a society that says, not, not only can you do this, you have to do this. And, you know, we're just, just doesn't make any sense. So that's the theory. Is this being taped? <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'll, 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 I'll stand behind it. Um, <laughs> this is the more, this is, this is, I think, the harder page. It's what I was talking about today, which is okay, let's shift into the, PBZ, the PBC regime. How are we going to make these decisions? And so we start with offer one, okay, we got, all we have is cash, it's a lot of cash, but that's how many quality units we have. And then we took offer two from the, from the last page and we say, okay, well now we can take this one because um, you know, there are these other values created, less, less value for the dollars, but we know we can balance, so we're gonna take the higher. And in fact, even with equal value, equal quality units, we can take offer three because we think we can be anywhere on that efficient frontier, or at least anywhere that's sort of reasonably in between. But, but then I think the questions start to get harder. You know, what happens if you've got a deal that's more balanced among the interests, so you've got pretty good on the cash, pretty good on jobs, pretty good on carbon footprint, but total, it's less. Can you, can you take that? Is value maximization maximize all the quality units? We're just taking more things into account in order to be economically efficient? Or is it, nah, we can, we can sacrifice some total value to treat everybody fairly? And, and, this, and these, just, these additional ones just kind of try to put more of a point on that. So I don't know the answer to any of those questions. And I don't necessarily even think I know what the right answer should be. But I think they're interesting questions that uh, hopefully there's going to be lots of benefit corporations and we'll get to, to learn about this over the next 35 years or so. Uh, thanks so much uh, for, for sticking around, and that was an extremely interesting presentation. Uh, some some uh, compelling transactions and lots of unanswered questions. Um, we have one more presentation for you today, which is some uh, a brand new research um, by uh, by Ann Tucker and Jess Jeffers here with us 
um, from uh, Wharton and from uh, Georgia State University School of Law. And if you give us just one second, we're going to get their slides up and get started. Okay, let's give a hand for, uh, for Ann Tuckers and Jess Jeffers. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask for a little bit of your uh, patience. I'm gonna go a little bit off script just in trying to be responsive to some of the things we've already heard. In the back, can you hear me if I don't use a microphone? I thought so, I teach large lectures. So this, uh, this, should, be, this should be doable. So um, we're here to talk um, about the question of benefit corporations, but from a slightly different perspective, which is looking at um, benefit corporations and alternative entity forms from the standpoint of investors. And Jessica and I are here as two members of our four member team who heard from David Musto earlier today on the finance panel. Um, we, our question is born of a rather practical one, which is um, when we have alternative entity forms, how can these entities raise capital and how can they have access to broader financial markets? And one piece of answering that question is looking at the role of institutional investors. And borrowing from recent investment trends, um, the emphasis that individual shareholders invest through institutional investors uh, demonstrates the need to focus on this type or category of investors. All right. so. I'll just go the old-fashioned way here. Um, so we've started today and most of our conversation with the notion that corporations must be loyal to the notion of maximizing shareholder profits and that it is a common denominator among for-profit <coughs> entities. And even if you take exception to that notion, and some do, it is a notion that is deeply ingrained in Delaware corporate law. Um, nonetheless, it is a, uh, what we would think of as a deceptively simple standard that is actually nuanced in application. So when we look at uh, the wealth maximization principle, we can undercut no, uh, the strength of the maximization principle on the grounds that there's no agreement about long-term versus short-term investment horizons. That was a message we heard from our investors and our entrepreneurs earlier today. Similarly, we have directors who can act subject to the protection of the business judgment rule, which not only gives them the presumption that they're acting correctly, but we also get a dichotomy or a division between the standard of conduct that's aspirational, this wealth maximization, and what is actually their standard of liability, what they're exposed to, which is a much lower or smaller standard for them um, to be exposed to. If, if you don't take comfort in those two notions or sort of a shoestring approach to an ability to seek something other than profit maximization, there's been two different types of legislative responses. And both have been discussed at some length today. Um, and they focus on the actions or the uh, powers of directors in this capacity. So the first is constituency statutes passed in the late 80s through the early 90s. And the strength of this legislative response demonstrated we have 32 states that have passed constituency-like statutes, and they should be thought of as essentially a precursor to the benefit corporation statutes. Um, they allow for directors to take into consideration other constituencies, including long-term entrants, and some of them limit liability or limit exposure to liability. Right, so further distancing the standard of wealth maximization from the scope of potential liability. The other legislative response has been the subject of today's uh, 
conference looking at benefit corporations. And we've got 14 that are active, four that are being enacted this year, and four more that have passed. And I'm not going to go over the statutory elements since we've, um, others who've gone before us have already covered that in some length. All of this, though, has been focused on what can the director do in pursuit of other purposes. We haven't spent as much time looking at this question from the standpoint of shareholders, right? And so we are looking at this from the aspect of raising capital and looking at what, um, what can shareholders do who want to pursue other types of interests. All right, so we're looking at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, and when we think about this, uh, there is a significant appetite for um, alternative investment models. As of 2010, over $300 billion in open, open mutual funds uh, were under SRI, or Socially Responsible Investment Guidelines. Um, 266 SRI funds were operating in the United States. So we have an appetite for this, but there's a distinction when we invest individually on our own behalf and when institutional investors invest on behalf of others. And that is the tension or the issue that we're particularly interested in in this, in this project, is when we have investors that have other people's money and are investing on behalf of them, and whether or not there are legal impediments or barriers for that form of investment to be funneled into alternative purpose or alternative focus entities. Um, so let's review the type of institutions and the legal, uh, the legal standards, and then I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Jessica, who can tell you what our initial findings revealed in this area. So the reason um, we're focusing on this type of institutional investor and this category is um, we want to demonstrate the strength of the, the, the strength of the institutional investors in terms of the trends. So currently, we have um, so 28% of US equity capital is held in investment companies. And part of that is pushed by trends and how we save for retirement. Um, over $19 trillion were under retirement focused um, or classified as retirement focused investments at the end of 2012. Um, of these, of the categories, um, the two largest categories, defined benefit and co defined contribution, are subject to a unique set of fiduciary duties. Right? So we're looking at a really large, um, a large capital pool in our markets that are subject to a unique set of fiduciary duties. And the difference between pensions or defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans, they have slightly different fiduciary standards and slightly different um, slightly different fiduciary standards and slightly different uh, liability standards so that if you have a defined benefit plan, uh, you're exposed to the strictest or the highest form of potential liability um, for managing this type of assets. And to review what we're talking about when we mean additional types of fiduciary duties, so not just this notion to maximize shareholder wealth, but um, when, when investing on behalf of a defined benefit plan, you're subject to this unique set of duties of um, exclusive benefit, prudence, expenses, and diversification. Guidance from the Department of Labor as to what this means when it comes to pursuing other types of purposes has been reduced to the following. The notion that we have to consider, we have to consider investments on the basis of availability, riskiness and the potential return that can be gathered. Okay. This in the context specifically of pursuing an alternative or an other purpose, guidance has said it's okay to consider a collateral benefit, but only when we can ensure that it is equal in the type of risk and return that it would be, um, would be exposed to with similar types of instruments. So in our conversation about um, in our conversation about what types of standards uh, must these companies perform under, and how do we quantify the type of benefit that can be um, obtained through them, it is in part of a notion that uh, the large pools of capital have to meet this standard. Um, Chief Justice Strine mentioned earlier today uh, that he considers it a violation of this duty, specifically when companies, uh, when pension funds invest. 
uh, not only in, or hypothetically in, benefit corporations, but also when they invest in Europe or in states outside of Delaware that are subject to these other types of laws. So our question, our inquiry here is, um, is essentially twofold. Within our project, we want to first identify potential legal barriers or impediments to matching this large pool of capital with these investment opportunities as seen in benefit corporations. One, so in order to understand what the strategy might be, how to match this capital with these opportunities, we need to understand what those barriers are before we can strategize how to overcome, or think about how to overcome those barriers. So that's the first part of the project. The second part of the project is to say, we don't know how institutional investors will respond to an opportunity to invest in benefit corporations, but we have historical data about how they responded to constituency statutes, which brings us to um, the second part, um, the second part of our presentation here today, which is um, we can look at the historical, we can look at the historical data to understand how institutional investors responded to not exactly the same, but a similar set of circumstances with the adoption of constituency statutes. And the reason we focus on constituency statutes is, while they're not exactly the same, um, there is a, a, a common structure between the two, focusing on the authority of the director to pursue other types of purposes, um, identifying those other stakeholders and naming them in the statutes, and restricting exposure to liability. Obviously, the benefit corporation statute expands the scope, but of focusing on a constituency statute gives us a good, um, a good starting point for this larger question about um, what do the behavior trends tell us. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over, um, turn it over to our colleagues. Okay, so, give me one second. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through our empirical results and I realize that it's late in the afternoon and I'm actually going to ask you to think a little bit about statistics. I promise I'll try to keep it uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so, uh, as Anne mentioned, we're going to use constituency statutes as provisions that allowed directors to sort of diverge from this exclusive goal of maximizing shareholder value. And we're interested in how institutional investors reacted, in particular uh, institutions with strong fiduciary duties. Uh, so to do this, uh, we use 13F data. So the SEC requires any investor with uh, control over at least $100 million in assets to fill out a 13F report every quarter detailing all of the securities in its portfolio as well as the number of shares held for that security. Um, and then we're going to use along with that, so first, uh, so those 13F filers, uh, those investors with control over more than $100 million in assets, that's, that's what, who I'm going to call institutional investors here. Uh, and we combine this data with uh, CRISP data, so for any non-finance people in the room, that's uh, the Center for Research and Security Prices has data on all of the securities in the United States, essentially. And uh, we use this data to map each security back to its company and to the state that that company is incorporated in. So we now have essentially a database where we have for each company held by 13F uh, institutional investors, the percent of shares held by institutional investors, as well as the number of individual institutions holding a stake in that um, company. So we have all of this data between 1980 and 2010. And uh, just to recap, this is uh, quarterly data where we have um, at the company level um, the state of incorporation the companies incorporated in 50 different states and uh, measures of institutional investor participation in each of these companies. And we're going to use constituency statutes that were passed in 32 different states over this period of time to see how institutional investment reacts to a provision uh, that allows directors to consider the interests of non-shareholder constituents. So just before I get to the results, let me briefly show you uh, the size of institutional investment over this period. I know Anne sort of got to that, but 
uh, very briefly. Uh, so here on the y-axis, uh, you have the percent of shares held by 13F uh, entities in the average company, uh, and I plot this for every quarter in our sample period. Uh, and this is just to fix in your mind sort of the, the magnitudes uh, of institutional investment. You know, the, the, the top there is 50%, so it's not that uh, institutions are holding the entirety of the companies, but uh, you see um, an increasing trend over time. And, and part of this is that uh, there is a $100 million threshold to becoming a, uh, to having to file a 13F report, so more institutions over time begin to qualify for that threshold. And it gives you a sense of the magnitudes. Uh, so this is the part uh, where I briefly describe our statistical approach. Uh, so uh, we use a difference in differences approach, uh, which is a classic tool in empirical corporate finance. And what it does is it compares the change around the passage of the law in a state that passes the law to a change in a state that does not pass the law. So essentially, we're treating each constituency statute passage as a sort of mini experiment where we're looking at how investment reacts in the different treatment groups. Um, so specifically, we have a, an indicator that turns on uh, when you're incorporated in a state uh, after the constituency statute is passed. And then we also include uh, firm and time fixed effects to control for any location and time trends uh, that's in the entire population. Uh, and so again, this allows us to see if there's a systematic relationship between the level of investment and being in a constituency state. And so it's important here that we have uh, 32 states passing these laws in 20 different quarters over a range of time so that it's extremely unlikely that we have something else driving our results. Essentially, to have something else driving our results, you would need something that's happening systematically in that same state at that same time. So uh, let me turn to the results when we look at the percent of shares held by institutional investors. So here the outcome variable that I'm looking at is the percent of shares held by institutional investors. And each column represents a different window that I isolate around the law's passage. So uh, in the first column, I'm uh, looking at four quarters before and after the law's passage. In the second column, I'm looking at three years before and three years after. And I'm looking at five years before and five years after, and then 10 years before and after. Uh, and I do this uh, to see if there's maybe a different effect when we look at the short term and when we look at the long term. Um, and what you see is actually that um, most of uh, these coefficient estimates, so, so that first row is the estimate of the coefficient on uh, the indicator that a constituency statute was passed. And all of these estimates here are pretty close to zero, certainly not statistically distinguishable from zero. So based on this information, it does not look like constituency statute had any effect on the percent of shares that were held by institutional investors. So um, I have a, uh, a graph that I think uh, helps to visualize this. So here I'm just plotting the results uh, from, that I just showed you. Uh, so on the y-axis I have the estimate of my coefficient um, on the law passed indicator. And uh, I'm plotting this uh, for every sort of window that I estimated my results in. Um, so, so I wanna uh, emphasize that uh, each point underlying this graph is a separate regression. I just I connect the dots so that it's easier to see the trend. Uh, but it's, uh, I have 10 different regressions, essentially. And uh, the dashed lines are the confidence intervals around the estimate. So uh, in light gray, there's a 90% confidence level. In darker gray, there's a more conservative 95% level. And uh, what you see is that whether you look at short-term or long-term windows, um, our estimate uh, seems pretty close to zero throughout. And certainly, zero is well within our confidence level. Uh, so now, 
what does zero represent? Oh, so, so zero uh, would represent, so, so this uh, coefficient uh, tells you how much of the investment level you can, so in this case, how much of the percent of shares held by institutions you can attribute to just being in a constituency state once the law is passed. So zero means it doesn't look like there's any effect. Unless it's this case of nothing Yeah, exactly. Um, any other questions? So yeah. If this, if the uh, confidence intervals, if those bands were narrower, that would mean that they were more confident that it, that it spit zero? Less so, if, um, so if you look at the first point, um, you see how it's slightly below zero. If you had a dashed line that was, uh, that was below zero, it would tell you that you know, you're 90% confident that your estimate is, is different from zero, right? So those, those there are confidence bands of where we think that that estimate is, essentially. And if, but if we saw them, if we saw them narrower, then we'd be more confident that it's within. That it's close to zero, exactly. yes. Okay. So now, um, let, me, let me show you, and I just have two more slides. Um, so let me show you the results when we look at the number of institutions that hold a stake in these companies. So this is the same, uh, this is the same table that I showed you before, but now the outcome variable that we're looking at is the number of institutions that hold a stake in the company. And uh, again, the columns are different windows that I look at around the passage of the law. And that first row shows uh, the estimate of the, the difference in the number of investors um, after the law was passed. So what it means is that um, on average, if you look at the four quarters after the law was passed, a company incorporated in a constituency state had two fewer investors, institutional investors, than a company incorporated in another state. If you look at Three years after, on average, a company incorporated in a constituency state had three fewer institutional investors than a company incorporated in another state. Five years later, on average, it's four fewer. And then um, when you, we were looking at 10 years uh, after the law's passage, that estimate is no longer statistically significant, meaning that, you know, we can't uh, say with certainty that it's different from zero, but it looks like it's sort of continuing a trend. Uh, and so again, let me show you that graph because I think that it um, explains, uh, it, it shows the results in a better way. So to fix the magnitudes in your mind, um, the median number of institutional investors for a company in our sample is about 20. So this is a distribution that has a very long right tail, meaning that our very, the very largest companies have hundreds of institutional investors. But half of the companies in our sample have 20 or fewer institutions holding a stake in the company. So for these companies, a drop of two to five institutional investors is reasonably big. So, uh, so here again, I have the estimate of my coefficient on this indicator that the law was passed, uh, and I'm uh, looking at all of these different windows around the passage of the law. And, and what you see here in contrast to the previous graph when we were looking at the percent of shares held by institutions is that there does seem to be a trend. My, my dashed lines are below zero, actually up to, if, you, if you're looking at a 90% confidence level, this is up to eight years after the law's passage. It's a pretty long-term effect. And it seems to be declining and sort of tapering off towards the end. Uh, so why is this interesting? Well, so the fact that we see um, a change in the number of institutions that hold a stake in the company but not in the percent of shares held by institutional investors, suggests to me that while some inv institutional investors are divesting, others are picking up their slack. And so this is constituent with a theory that these types of provisions are 
problematic for some institutional investors, but not for others. And moreover, the fact that the percent of uh, shares held by institutional investors does not seem to change suggests that the market's expectation of the company's performance is not changing. Rather, something else might be driving divestment by these other institutional investors. And so obviously the next step is for us to figure out which institutional investors are divesting and see if, for example, you know, pension funds or other funds with strong fiduciary duties could be driving this change. Unfortunately, I can't tell you that at the stage, um, but it's certainly, certainly an interesting result for us. Questions? Uh, the previous presenter, I think, left. I think that's right. Okay. Um, do you want to go through the attendees at all? Is there anything, or is that just to make sure that the questions? No, just if, if those questions okay. come up, yeah. I think. Well, let's uh, setting. lobby for a certain type of, yeah. Um, we see that the most in the context of um, multi-employer um, union plans, where there's a strong, where the, the fund itself is governed half by the sponsor and half by, um, by representatives of the participants. Um, the, you see it a little bit, um, not so much at the government level, um, but in private pensions, there's often some kind of survey about what's important and what should be included. And there's a government accountability office report from 2012 that documents how um, employee participant appetite has driven some of the private pension investment in this space. Are there any for you know changes in valuation because I'm thinking you know okay 
case there's this girl in the room who, who isn't, who doesn't like, uh, you know, who doesn't like to stay back out. And I mean, I'm going to stick in. I'm more than happy if they're going to give me their stake at, you know, if they're going to take a couple turns of either doc evaluation, then I'm really happy to take their stake. It's a great question, and uh, we're working on that, looking at uh, if there are any price changes. It, that, that really should tell you if there's a change in the market's perception. I, it's true, I, I, it was a little bit of a stretch uh, because I don't have those results yet, but um, so would that be we can look at that. Advanced study that with the passage of, have you looked do at? the same thing that we're doing now, but just look at um, the price of the companies. Okay. And there should not be a systematically a drop in share price around those uh, statutes unless there's an effect of the statutes on the share price directly. We do have a way, right? Eric, I and, and this is when I get very nervous that I've started answering or started speaking in response to specifically given questions. This is not my area of expertise. But um, when we, the summary slide that shows the basic results, we've got firm fixed effect, location fixed effect. Um, and so we can, there is, a, there is a control that's trying to say, we want to make certain we're not looking at something that's idiosyncratic to you know, this type of location or this type of firm in right. this particular window. Okay. Right, but that's the, the, the direct way to look at it. So yes, we're, we're also taking out anything that's sort of firm specific, anything that's, you know, everyone in, that, in 1989 did poorly or something like that. We take all of that out. Um, and we only look at sort of the, the uh, additional variation. But to answer your question directly, we can look at the prices of shares and it's on our slate. This is just, these are preliminary results we haven't gotten to yet. And getting, that's getting to the whole question about market expectation of companies, not directly to divesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I have a follow-up question kind of. I can be in you. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, no, 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 it's okay. I'm just letting you two know you're in the queue. So, um, I mean, when we're thinking about the B Corp movement, um, how have you thought about how transferable this is going to be to, um, I mean, I see a constituency statute, maybe I don't know enough about those, and, and I see something that, that seems kind of extrinsic to the corporation, whereas you know, the benefit of the corporation is incorporated with this, and you know, if I'm, if I'm a buy, buy side, The substatute in some state constituency statute seems to have a lot less to do with my investment than if the company is incorporated with, you know, if it's got a document with this particular um, goal. And so, I mean, is there anything that you could look at, like maybe with disclosure or uh, that our investors are looking at, um, or do you feel like your your um, research is showing that they just didn't look at these types of things, or I guess if there's a Decrease the number of investors that they must have looked at. You're saying is if it's less since constituency statutes are less closely tied to the identity and mission of a particular company from an investor standpoint, you're wondering I mean, if they were well, acting with yes. knowledge. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, have you thought about how how you know yeah. how we can transfer this response to constituency statutes into how we can go in response to B Corps? Will be like, I mean, and I'm more severe. Yeah, would it, would it be muted or would it be? So my expectation is that it would be more pronounced in a benefit corporation. I think that's right. Um, I think though that what we want to, I think that there's a larger part of the story, and this is in part why Jess is looking at, the, Jessica is looking at the data at both the short term and the long term effect to say, look, is there sort of a reaction that the market has, but then once we figure out what this means and things like uncertainty go away, maybe maybe that, that um, those levels uh, Taper out or flatten out at the end, and, and we end up not having um, not having much of an effect. One thing that we should be mindful of is that we have lots of examples of companies that do other things already and do other things without facing liability. Um, we have example. We've heard lots of examples about this today. Um, Apple was just in the news. Costco was an example that we've heard of. Um, any company that has a sustainability program, a women and minority mentorship program, diversity in terms of hiring or supply line programs, these are all in pursuit of something that you could you could qualify as other. So while it might not be as closely identified with the type of corporate entity, the 
fact that there is in the, there is in 32 states legislation that authorizes to some extent this type of other purpose, um, we are still, it may not be as intentional, but we do see some um, outbreaks. So you're always going to have, you know, 40% of companies uh, in the U.S. are incorporated in Delaware, and those never are uh, in a state that passes a constituency statute. Right. So I would, that, yeah. that goes towards my second point, which is that, you know, certain states are traditionally first actors when it comes to progressive uh, business legislation. I was wondering if you found any correlation to, you know, states incorporated in California that are tech-heavy states versus So are you asking this with the idea that you know maybe we're picking up an effect that is not due to the passage of the law, but rather due to just being incorporated in California or something? Is yeah, or really being incorporated anywhere outside. Great, I'm glad you asked that. Um, because we have firm fixed effects, that's already taken into consideration. You would need this effect to happen not just in uh, companies incorporated in California and other uh, constituency states, but at the time that they pass a constituency statute. And, and these are different for different states. So, you know, you have 20 different quarters in which these laws are passed it's over, you know, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, there are even a couple after 2000. So, so we would not be picking up the effect that you're saying. Yeah. We've also looked give us a sense to like we looked at both passage date and um, enactment date mm -hmm. um, to look and see like well maybe maybe something that's doing it is that people because some in some states there's a lag between when a statute is passed and when it's enacted and so we thought well if you know that this is coming up um, you're going to divest early and so if we just look afterwards or after the enactment date versus the passage date we may be looking we may be seeing something else um, Jessica has routinely described her approach to the statistics, even the preliminary ones here, as very conservative. There are ways that we, there, there are things that we could be doing that could sort of um, strengthen the results that we're showing. And um, I think she's been very, very careful in being conservative in her approach. Right. We see this, we've tried a, a lot of different ways of running the analysis, essentially, and this, this uh, effect is pretty robust. So a couple of questions. First of all, on, on the data and then on the policy and then the last query. I was curious where you got your you know, data from and what subset of firms you're looking at because my understanding of the percentage of firms that are currently owned by institutions is significantly higher than 50%. So and maybe that's just because I'm more familiar with like the S&P 500, but I would feel it was in the range of like 70%. So the fact that you guys are coming out with like 50 percent. So, so this is not the 50 percent is the average percent of the company that's held right. by institutional investors, not I mean. the average I'm number saying, of companies yeah. held what by. Yeah. I mean is so like on the S&P company, S&P 500 company, my understanding was about 70, 70 plus percent of the market cap was held by institutions. So I'm trying to figure out what the discrepancy is. So it's probably the reporting threshold um, right. and. That number, so to a couple of points to this. One, um, the 13F data is $100 million assets under management. So that's an important threshold. Two, our data stops at 2010. Um, the hedge fund regulations that went into effect last year um, make a distinction between 100 million and 150 million assets 
under management. And so um, there's, been, there's been some other studies that have shown how it's pushed so that we now have things that are way over that benchmark and, and companies that it pushed under. So there is, there is a sizable pool of, um, of investors with less than that 100 or 150 mark to avoid the yeah. disclosures um, for hedge funds. And that would also affect, like, regardless of the risk that I've seen the Goldman Sachs set, and I think mm -hmm. they get G's, X's, D's, uh, and then I guess they get like top five titles and top six or, um, you know, over five percent of holders can catch these names. So, and they, that's the numbers that they're normally indicating is like, you know, 70 percent plus. So, that's what I'm, I'm wondering, is there some... So we're using the Thomson Reuters feed, which uh, I know FactSet also has a 13F uh, feed. We're using the Thomson Reuters one. I don't know if uh, there shouldn't be a difference though uh, in which one we use. But yeah, so and maybe the key thing goes from another question. Are you guys using the S and P five hundred or the Russell three thousand or just everything? No, we're using everything. yeah. Well, so we're looking um, at all common stock, American stock. Uh, essentially, I think I think the, so. We're filtering out uh, anything that's not. Um, that's not those things. Uh, but otherwise, we're looking at all companies. So, so your, your point is, like, there is a lot of companies that are not on that S&P 500, and that's going to bring down that right. 70%. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's true, yeah. That's and that's why when Jessica was also explaining, um, I think she used the phrase, a long right tail, the notion that we're going to have, like, in, in all the companies that we've looked at, they're all, they have different numbers of institutional investors. We have some on the far end that are going to have hundreds, but for um, the median of our, of our sample, the, the number of institutional investors is like 20, which right. is also a very different story than what you're gonna get with like the SP 500. Right, yeah. so it's possible that your results are actually be, being driven by the small companies, and which is also consistent with the constituency statutes being in place in states other than Delaware and generally the smaller mm -hmm. states that yeah. might have. So it's interesting, companies. so uh, yeah. we could certainly uh, look at this in different, like we, we could divide the sample into uh, like but by asset uh, size, um, something like that, and see if the effect holds. I would actually think that most interesting for us is the smaller companies, because at this stage, benefit corporations are still none of them are public. They're still fairly small for the most part, uh, and so I think it would be most interesting to see what the effect is in slightly smaller companies. So you mentioned Follow on question, I guess, was with respect to so you, a lot of your conclusions. It sounds like are, are based on this lack of a change in percentage of institutional ownership. At the same time as there's a reduction in the number of institutional owners, mm -hmm. so it's the, it's the institutional owners that are dropping out are the smaller institutional owners. And as you guys said, you're, you're based on F, so it might be in a hundred million, hundred. Uh, Institutional investor that has a hundred million might only have you know a hundred thousand dollars invested in a particular company. If, if they were to drop out, then it wouldn't surprise me that you're not going to see a change in the percentage mm -hmm. institutional ownership, which would largely be driven by the vanguards and the right. And I think this might be discreet. Yeah. yeah. So this speaks exactly to what our focus is now, which is figuring out which which institutions are the ones driving the divestment. Uh, and, and that's that's exactly what we're working on now. Uh, these are you know, these are pretty pre preliminary results. And then just to, and my generalizability question is: most of these constituency statutes came in in the late '80s, early '90s, mm -hmm. and my understanding of the political economy surrounding them is that they were they weren't actually progressive statutes at all. In some cases, they were about protecting, allowing. Sure, they, they were sort of part of the whole anti-takeover yes. yes. movement, yeah. It varies, I think, based on the states in which they came in. I think some of this protection of workers against hostile takeovers. But how can you then generalize from that to things that are happening now and things that are happening with a much more progressive bent and with a, a slightly different political background? I think that's a very good question in terms of the reasons why. Um, and I think it's a good part of the discussion. I don't think it changes the fact that we're talking about exposure based on the legal regime. And that legal regime, regardless of the intent, right, the statute, the statutory construction, right, we can put the constituency statutes, we can map that against the benefit statutes, and we can see a parallel in their structure. And the purpose might be that they were intended to be used in one way, but not
nonetheless, um, I would say we also have, as I was responding to, to another audience member, we have a pretty robust set of examples of, of companies that do other types of things and other types of things without facing legal liability for that. So um, I, I think it's an important part of the story. I don't know that it, it at, for at least not having thought about it more than the 30 seconds I've been talking, um, I don't know that it necessarily undercuts what we're trying to say. Um, and I think this gets to one other point, which is if we were setting out to prove or make some kind of claim about what is likely to happen with benefit corporations and how institutional investors will respond to them, I don't think any of us would dream up a perfect data set where we're looking at institutional investors from 13F data, right? But it is what we have. Um, and so in terms of is there, and, and this is the only type of information um, that we're aware of that anyone is looking at this. So I think having something, um, a starting point is a helpful part of the conversation. It's not a perfect um, view into the future by any means, but it is a, it's a starting point for a larger conversation. And it seems like it doesn't matter why the statutes were passed, if the question is, does it scare investors? Or the motive behind why the constituency statutes were passed or why the benefit corporation statutes were passed is irrelevant if it's scary to investors, right? So if it's scary to them and it was passed for a reason that's actually really encouraging you know, corporate reform, those, those are going to hold plenty of thoughts in those too. So I think that there is some, the best, the bit that has to be less cautious. Right. And there's also the fallacy of collective intent, the notion that's emerging. Have you, have you thought about uh, signatories to the UN Global Compact? I'm not sure what share of uh, still publicly traded corporations that would represent, but certainly they are subscribing to a set of uh, principles and rules that might be perceived by institutional shareholders as conflicting with the interests. I'm not sure. Well, How binding is that compact? It's, uh, because I, I think know. that's the, for me, that's the key thing at the center. Is it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's binding, but it is something that's signed. Mm -hmm. so, uh, well, I think throughout the day, we've been trying to get at this distinction between a business approach that is uh, sustainable or environmentally friendly, et cetera, because you think that in the long term, it's value maximizing. And having a legal regime that allows you legally to not only have value maximization in mind. And, and those, you know, I, I think that most of us will agree that uh, in most cases, we think that both are going to be the same. Uh, so that uh, businesses are not trying to expropriate shareholders that they are legitimately trying to do the right thing because they also believe that that is their best business practice. Uh, and that, and this is part of what we've been calling the hard question is, but when that doesn't happen, are you in a situation where you're in a non-binding, um, no, you're not legally protected for taking an action that furthers your social mission but not your value versus are you in a legal framework that allows you to expropriate shareholder value, expropriate shareholders and do good with other people's money? I think there's also, I think it also gets at a, at a larger question that we have in corporate law, which is there is a disconnect between, um, between our aspirational standards and our standards of liability. We have that um, in the duty of care imposed on directors and for-profit corporations. Um, and in my mind, looking at a, a non-binding aspirational conduct is, is saying this is what we want to do. And in part, um, looking at the constituency statutes and looking at the benefit corporation statutes is answering the question of um, when we take these other actions, how are, or when directors take these other actions, how are they exposed to liability? I realize it's a much less um, fun question, right? It's way better to be aspirational and, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a much more uh, interesting way to approach it. Um, but I think in terms of, as Jessica was 
saying that the change in the legal regime, um, I think the constituency statute maximum closing is what we're looking at in the benefits case. But I think it's definitely part of the discussion. Isn't it part of um, the Medicaid contract and the contingency statute and the equal legislation is that under the contingency statute, you are out of Strengthening from a may to a shall is, um, is, is a very big change. Um, and also, uh, the benefit corporation statutes uh, require a purpose other than profit. So naming and declaring that other purpose, um, strengthening uh, directors not only authority, but now it's an obligation. That's a significant change. Imposing reporting requirements so that there is a level of accountability because if you have a shall language but without any enforcement mechanism, there's nothing. So the reporting obligation is in fulfillment of that shall obligation and some and also the, the private right of action vests in shareholders. So um, there is a significant difference between, um, there is a significant difference between the two. I think at best we can view constituency statutes as an early precursor. And, so, and the other thing is that Two of the states, so it's a pretty yes. small sample size, but uh, Connecticut and Arizona, uh, when they passed the constituency statutes, they had in their language that uh, a shall, this is, this is why Anne was using shall versus may. So most states pass it as you may consider the interests of non-shareholder uh, non constituents. Arizona and Connecticut, when they passed the statute, said you shall consider the interests of non-shareholder constituents. and. Uh, is great because everyone's getting to uh, all of the analysis that we intend yeah. to do. Unfortunately, um, I don't have those results to show, but we want to test that um, uh, whether the effect is stronger. And we would expect, you know, if it is, if our, you know, if, if our story sort of holds, we would expect the uh, effect to be more pronounced in those two states. Two states. The one, I would say, the one caveat is that it's only two states, and they're fairly small states, so small. It's, um, it, it, is, it might be hard to get any statistical power in, in running those tests, but it's certainly something that we intend to try. Yeah, thank you all for um, your questions, and thank you to the editors for having us here today. It's been a great event to participate in, and we appreciate the opportunity to share with you our work. Thanks again to, uh, to Professor Tucker and to Jessica Jeffers uh, for a really interesting presentation and a great way to wrap up the day. Um, that's it for our Benefit Corporations Conference. Uh, I, I'm really thankful to, uh, to all of you for coming out. And I just wanted to remind you that in addition to this conference, we're publishing a number of articles uh, on the topic. Um, in the next couple of months, uh, these will be posted on HBLR's website, uh, including an article by Chief Justice Strine, an article by Rick Alexander and the rest of his team, um, a foreword by Andrew Kasoy um, and Jay Gilbert, the founders of B-Lab, who I think uh, just had to leave to, to go to an HBS class. Um, and we're, we're also hoping that in, in the fall we uh, might also be able to, to publish some of the, uh, the rest of the really interesting research um, that, that uh, Professor Tuckers and Jessica Jeffers are, are putting together along with uh, David Musto at Wharton. So please keep your eye out. Um, subscribe at hblr.org. Take a look. And, uh, and we're going to have a lot of scholarship uh, on these and other topics coming soon. So thanks again, um, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Is this all everything this is you, mine. you have? Okay. Um, this was up here. Okay.